This video is sponsored by Displate. Jabba ruled with fear. I intend to rule with respect. Welcome to the Screen Crush Break Room. I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things that you might have missed in episode one of The Book of Boba Fett. The episode is called Stranger in a Strange Land, and the title alone gives us several references that set the stage for this entire series. So the title is taken from a Bible verse, Exodus 2.22, and it's Moses referring to himself. See, Moses was born as a Hebrew slave in Egypt, then sent down the river as an infant, like so much Kal-El, where he was found and raised by the family of the Pharaoh. When the Pharaoh found out that Moses was a Hebrew, he cast him out to live among his own people. Left for dead on the sands of Tatooine. This is very much like Boba Fett. He had a place at the court of Jabba the Hutt, and in the flashbacks, we see that he's been forced to live in the desert with the Tuscans. There are a lot of Egyptian references in this episode. Boba is suited up like Yul Brenner's pharaoh in the Ten Commandments. We also see Egyptian influences in the architecture of Mos Espa, and the writing here like hieroglyphics. And later, Fennec Shan says, You should have let them carry you on the litter. This is very much like Egyptian royalty, or lords in feudal Japan, or even the Middle Ages in Europe. But Boba, he's a man of the people, and he wants them to see his face. Stranger in a Strange Land is also a sci-fi novel by Robert Heinlein about a human raised by Martians on Mars who goes to Earth to try to live among his own people. Again, reflecting the path of Boba Fett trying to find his way in a new setting. The episode opens with the emptiness of Jabba's palace and its stark contrast to the bustling place that we saw in Return of the Jedi. Boba Fett is in a Bacta tank recuperating from his injuries. Now, Bacta is a healing liquid that we've seen several times in Star Wars, first in The Empire Strikes Back and also here in Vader's Palace in Rogue One. Having Boba return to the Bacta tank serves a couple purposes. It gives him a physical weakness to overcome. He's still in the process of healing and he isn't yet whole, just like his criminal empire is not yet whole. And also it means that his scars will be healed, both a metaphor for Boba overcoming adversity and practicality. It means Tamara Morrison won't have to sit in a makeup chair for hours before every episode. While in Bacta, he dreams. We see Kamino, the place of his birth, the death of his dad on Geonosis, actually using footage from Attack of the Clones that we've never seen before, this high wide shot. Then we get the Sarlacc escape, the moment we've wanted to see since this happened. In the old expanded universe, Boba Fett escapes the Sarlacc by detonating his jetpack. Now, this is kind of a similar origin with him using fire to escape. He probably had to superheat the gases in the Sarlacc's belly, which then heated his armor and gave him these scars. It is interesting that he had to use the air in a stormtrooper's helmet to escape. Ralph McQuarrie originally designed the stormtroopers, and actually Darth Vader, to be able to survive and fight in space, hence the air tank. But wait a minute, there were no stormtroopers on Jabba's sail barge. That's right, Doug, there weren't. But you will remember this line. In his belly, you will find a new definition of pain and suffering as you are slowly digested over a thousand years. So it's very likely that this stormtrooper has been here for decades. Maybe these stormtroopers were even sent from the Empire to Jabba to demand some kind of tribute, and then Jabba disposed of them. But more than likely, this is just some poor bastard that fell in because of low visibility. I can't see a thing in this helmet. There's even a chance that this is a clone trooper from just after the Empire started to transition to humans, when clones would have been made to wear this armor. If so, then it would be fitting if Boba Fett had to evolve past the Sarlacc by using the body of one of his dead clone brothers. And that is one of my favorite Easter eggs in the episode. Hey, what's this mean? Boba Fett bonds. Is that like glue? Oh no, bonds are like when someone's released from jail pending trial. Then they hire a bounty hunter like Boba Fett to track them down. Like Max Cherry and Jackie Brown. Exactly, and these are actually exclusive metal posters made by Displate, the sponsor of this video. These posters are great. They're durable, but you hang them with magnets, and they have posters officially licensed by Marvel, DC, Star Wars, including a ton of great Boba Fett designs. In fact, there's more than 1.4 million designs. But that's so many. Well, if you click the link in the description, you'll see my profile where I've curated some of my favorite posters on the site. I have different collections for Hawkeye, Spider-Man, Boba Fett, and many more. Each disc plate is printed on demand, has a fast delivery, and is signed by a master of production. Plus, every time you buy one of these metal posters, this plate plants a tree. So buying a disc plate is good for the environment and for your break room. And we're offering Screen Crush fans a special discount. If you click the link in the description, you get your first one to two disc plates for 23% off. Three or more are 29% off. What a savings. When he escapes, we get this awesome visor POV shot. One of many great visual innovations by director Robert Rodriguez, one of my favorite all-time directors.
For instance, the grainy, dreamlike appearance of Boba in the desert seems like a callback to the dream sequences in his first film, El Mariachi. Outside, we see the remains of the sail barge and the Sarlacc's tentacle, maybe the one that was damaged here. The Jawas then strip him of his armor, leading into the events with Cobb Vanth that we saw in Season 2 of The Mandalorian, where he gets the armor. Then he's enslaved by the Tusken Raiders. We've actually seen this before in Attack of the Clones with Shmi Skywalker. I thought it was interesting that Boba is wearing an all-white jumpsuit, just like we saw clone cadets wear in the Clone Wars animated series. But symbolically, this is saying that Boba Fett is pure, like a child being reborn into a new life. We see the Sand People riding single file. Sand people always ride single file to hide their numbers and they're dragging Boba behind them in what feels like an homage to the good and the bad and the ugly. The Mandalorian was filled with references to the Sergio Leone Spaghetti Western trilogy, and it looks like we're gonna see that continued in the spin-off, just with a lot of biblical Egyptian references as well. I thought it was interesting that the Sand People village is made of tents and not huts, like we saw in Attack of the Clones. Now, this is obviously a more nomadic tribe. This could also be because of Anakin massacring that original village, which, by the way, is the moment that he falls to the dark side. They're like animals and I slaughtered them like animals. Oh, baby, that just makes me love you even more. Kissy. Now, in the old expanded universe, Anakin's slaughter of the Tuscans created a Tuscan myth that this area was guarded by a ghost, and so the Tuscans had to make sacrifices to appease this spirit. So it could be that Boba Fett and this Rodian snitch were intended to be that same sacrifice. A ghost receiving tribute from the Tuscans would parallel what we see today, with Boba receiving tribute from the underworld. I also like that we saw the Tuscans wearing different clothing, like this guy. His jewelry marks him as some kind of leader or chieftain of this group, unlike in The Mandalorian, which only showed the Tuscans wearing the same clothes that they wore in A New Hope. The lizard doll guarding Boba is called a Massif. We saw these in The Mandalorian, but also here, arguing over a bone in Attack of the Clones. Boba is nice to the Massif after he knocks it out. And this is an old screenwriting trick called Save the Cat, a way to show that your hero is a good person because he's kind to animals, and because this is a Disney Plus show and the hero can't actually be a ruthless crime lord. When Boba wakes up, he's attended to by service droids with heads similar to the service pit droids from The Phantom Menace. Then he arrives in the throne room to receive his tributes. Now this is a custom dating all the way back to the earliest civilizations, like Babylon, where conquerors were presented with gifts from their conquered people, like gold or an elephant, or that time in eighth grade when I gave Peter Jeremy the special edition copy of Man of Steel number 25 so he wouldn't hit me after gym class. That's exactly what happens here in this Star Wars show. Everything is both familiar and new. Again, it's like poetry, so if they rhyme. Now this droid might look familiar to you. This is 8D8 from Return of the Jedi. He wants to torture the Gamorrean guards. Their tortured squeals will send a piercing message to all potential challengers to your throne. Because remember, we saw him torturing a gonk droid in Jedi. <laughs> He's voiced by the great Matt Berry from Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, What We Do in the Shadows. You could assassinate the king. We don't have a king in America. Even easier. The Trandoshan pays tribute to Boba, calling him Daimo. This was a title given to feudal Japanese lords. Nice touch, since so much of Star Wars is inspired by samurai films. The Trandoshan gives Boba Fett a Wookiee pelt, and he wore Wookiee pelts on his armor in the original trilogy. Now, the mayor's majordomo is a Twi'lek, played by the brilliant Dave Pasquese from the best improv team on Earth, TJ and Dave. How do we stay afloat, you know? <laughs> <laughs> We got, we got inertia. Oh. Yeah, all right, here. These guys do an entire hour of an improvised one act, and they were doing it for years before Milovich and Schwartz took the idea and got a Netflix special out of it. Shade. Finnick Shan says, He'd have fed you to his menagerie. Now, we see one member of this monstrous menagerie in Return of the Jedi, his Rancor Malakili. But who else was in this menagerie? Well, in The Bad Batch, we met his infant Rancor, Moochie. And in the Expanded Universe, Jabba also had a crate Dragon, which probably won't be the case in the show because crate Dragons are now the size of Araka Sandworms. This does imply that there are other creatures lurking beneath Jabba's palace that could appear in future episodes. Then Boba takes a trip into Mos Espa, where he used to cruise in his DeLorean back when he was a peacetime Mandalorian. This is actually the the hometown of Anakin Skywalker that we saw in The Phantom Menace and briefly in Attack of the Clones. Damato as on Twitter points out that these droids are actually real life Boston Dynamic dog robots. And look everyone, it's Max Rebo. He got a new gig after Jabba's empire collapsed, playing with a Bith guitarist and a droid drummer. 
In fact, that guitarist might even be Figrin Den from the modal nodes. Thank you, we're the Cantina Band. If you have any requests, shout them out. Play that same song. All right, same song, here we go. The bartender is a species that we've seen in A New Hope and Rogue One, this is your mom. This droid is R3X from the Disney Star Tours ride. There are several astromech droids serving drinks. Now knowing that this is a familiar custom means that this line now makes more sense. I have need for you on the master sail barge. And I think you'll fill in nicely. Well, this is kind of silly though. These droids were built to navigate hyperlanes throughout the entire universe. Using them this way is like using a supercomputer to look up cat videos, which I, I guess basically is what we use our phones for. So <laughs> never mind. I know. The Twi'lek Madam of this house pays Boba with Republic credits, which you can see bearing the symbol of the New Republic. Spend them quick, Boba, because in like 20 years, those things are going to be useless. <laughs> Boba and Fennec are attacked by assassins using Electro Staffs, like we first saw Grievous' IG-100 droids use in Revenge of the Sith. <laughs> And notice these guys have red energy shields. Red to let us know that they're bad. But also, this seems like the same technology used to divide the Jedi from Darth Maul and their Phantom Menace duel. Hey, and it was nice to see Gamorreans actually being badasses instead of just being pig fodder for Jedi. <laughs> Simon Bath on Twitter points out that the helmet rolling on the ground is symbolic of how Jango Fett died, implying that if Boba continues down the same path for profit, then he'll reach the same end as his father. Awesome rooftop chase. In another flashback, we see the Red Key Raiders claiming a moisture farm and slaughtering the family. Now, we saw these Red Key Raiders in this flashback from The Mandalorian. This is right around when they would have forced Cobb Vanth into the desert so these timelines match up. Boba says, We can get to Anchorhead. I can get us off world. And this is the same town that Luke mentions in A New Hope. I can take you as far as Anchorhead. Finn Mahana on Twitter points out that this Rodian insult was first heard in The Phantom Menace. She's screwing dough pot, Slimo. Minucho NQ on Twitter noticed that there seems to be a lot of video game references in this show. There's graffiti in a rooftop chase from Assassin's Creed and Goro and Sub-Zero Mortal Kombat references. Boba kills this desert centaur with his chain, just like how Leia killed Jabba. Appropriate, since he is on a path to replace Jabba. Thanks, Ed Kalea on Twitter for that observation. Adam Lance Garcia on Twitter points out that the monster is a tribute to the Martians in Edgar Rice Burroughs' John Carter, a work that has inspired Star Star Wars, and pretty much everything that you love today. Now this gesture endures Boba to the tribe and earns him a kind of tribute from the chief. I wonder if every episode will show flashbacks to Boba's life that parallel what he's going through. In this episode, he has to fight to earn the tribute that he earns from the Tusken Chieftain, just as he has to fight to earn the respect of the people of Mos Espa in the present day. Well, that's just all the Easter eggs that I found, but if you found any, let me know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.